Why, why, did, I, why did I study architecture? Uh, I was brought up um, in London uh, back in the 60s and early 70s. And uh, I think it was a time of, of great change in, in Britain and in particular in London. And I can remember going to places like the, the Haywood Gallery and the, uh, the, the, um, the National Theatre, which were all new at the time, and these amazing sort of brutalist buildings were all going up in London at the time. All very unfashionable now. But I can just remember as a small person being incredibly impressed by these amazing buildings. The Brunswick Centre is another one. Just amazing, really sort of heroic pieces of brutalist architecture. And, you know, just being incredibly impressed by them. And also living in a very interesting, visually rich city. So you're constantly surrounded by visual interest and exciting buildings and interesting places and space. And just always, just always been an enthusiast. And that's all I've ever really wanted to do. How did you find BDP and what is your function in this practice? Uh, well, I'm, I'm, I'm an architect, so I'm a, I'm a designer, but obviously, as you, BDP is a huge practice, so we're um, the largest architectural practice in the UK, and also one of the biggest multidisciplinary design practices. So as you get more senior, inevitably, you have other roles and responsibilities, you're not necessarily the guy doing every drawing, you're involved in the management of the practice, you're involved in... Uh, deciding which opportunities to go for, involved in marketing, so it's a whole sort of range of things. Um, but but you know, but but I've I've always been very involved in projects, and I've never lost that. So whilst I wear quite a few different hats in terms of the management of the office and, and all of that, fundamentally I'm still an enthusiast for design. And I can always remember that first thing I worked on this big job down in Southampton, which was my first sort of post university project, um, which I worked on for four and a half years, saw it completed, went to the opening. It was on the front cover of the Architects Journal, you know, and I just remember thinking that was just the most amazing thing ever. You know, this job that I've been involved with is there on a magazine cover, and it's the best, you know, it's the best feeling ever. And uh, you know, that, that's always going to be a better feeling than, you know, looking at the figures and seeing that you've made, you know, ten pounds more profit on that job or ten pounds less on that one. Because fundamentally, no one goes to university to count money; they go to study architecture because they're enthusiastic about designing things. And you have a certain philosophy about what you want to reach with architecture? Well, I think, you know, B BDP is a big, a big company. So, uh, you know, our philosophy is quite an inclusive one. We, we're not Fosters or Rogers, you know, this is this thing we do, come and buy it. We're a bit more eclectic than that, I suppose. So, we're, 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 you know, we're, we're interested in actually talking to our clients and listening to them, which is maybe slightly unfashionable, but that's, but that's what we do. So we don't have a house style, we have an approach which is about working with the users, understanding the site and creating a building in a sort of an evolutionary and collaborative way. You know, we, we, we win lots of design awards but we don't win them because every building looks the same. We win them in spite of the fact every building looks different. I think at the moment the, the countries where we've been looking have tended to be the, you know, the BRIC countries, um, India, Russia, China. Um, Middle East less so, but you know they're, they're, these are these are countries that have got big programs of urban growth, um, huge programs of, of um, um, urbanisation, people moving into cities, building huge programs of offices, hospitals, shops, you know, you name it, and and they're, and they're behind us on the curve. So so at the moment we're at the stage of exporting European, well, let's not say British, but let's say European skills to these countries, but inevitably they're quick learners. Uh, and at some point, they'll be exporting their skills back into the UK. And, and you know, you do learn from other cultures and from other places and the different ways that people work. Architects need to look into the future to know how to build today. So mm. in your eyes, how will architecture play a part in the next few years? There's a whole series of major challenges for the, for the world at the moment. You know, resource depletion, um, climate change, and the whole sort of eruptions of the world economy um, that, m that make you think that the future actually isn't going to look like the past. We're not going to be doing the same things, we're going to be doing different things. Um, and and I've, I've, I'm not quite sure what the answer is, but I've got this thought that, um, you know, we, we, we architects need to more, work more closely with, with urbanists, urban designers, landscape architects, because actually at the moment in the UK there's more opportunity to design places between buildings than there are to design the buildings themselves. Uh, whilst in the past it was all about massive projects with huge developers and then sort of transforming massive swathes of the city, I think the future will be about small change, working with people on the ground, 
making little interventions that eventually add up into something bigger and changing, changing urban areas by stealth, if you like. You could also say that architecture is always a political statement as well. I think it's becoming, I think it, I think it always has been. And then I think we probably sort of lost sight of that in the boom years because it was, you know, you could just, everyone could keep busy doing stuff, designing buildings, which I suppose is kind of what we want to do. But, but interestingly, there's, I feel like we're in a moment in time now where people have sort of realised that the issues are too big to be solved by just building another whatever. And therefore, if you want to see significant radical change within your city or your environment, you have to explore other routes that previously we thought were off limits. They were the preserve of other people. You know, urban design was the preserve of urbanists. Landscape design was the preserve of landscape, landscape architects. Politics was the preserve of politicians. But, but you know, as, as architects, we of all people have, the, have an interest in our cities, our places of, of work and where we live with our families. So we need to get engaged with those bigger movements if we want to make a difference. Because in the end, um, just designing another office block isn't going to change Manchester or London or you know wherever it is. Do you think the time of the big names of the architects is over? N no, not really. Because I think I mean I, again, it's it's a bit like um, you know when you see f pictures of the sort of the city of London in the eighties and nineties. You know and they have sort of mobile phones this big. And all the women have big shoulder pads. You know, it's a, you know, the the sort of star architecture of the of the early two thousands and late nineteen nineties was was definitely of a time you know where people had a lot of money and it was about brands and status and egos yeah. and all the rest of it. But I, I suspect it's I suspect it's human nature that people will always there will always be a type of client who will always want that type of thing. Yeah. You know, maybe that's the top sort of five percent. And then there's, that, that actually doesn't really make a difference perversely because it's just a sort of, it's like having a, a Gucci handbag or a driving a Ferrari, isn't it? You've got a Zaha Hadid building. And then in the meantime, the, the other 95% is done by people who approach it in a slightly more um, uh, sort of mature and a calmer way and actually probably end up making more difference to real people's lives, which isn't about, you know, 55 story buildings in the city of London. It's about schools and hospitals and nurseries and places where real people go to because of their real lives, you know? What tip do you have? What good advice do you have for architects and students nowadays? <laughs> from your time that you thought this was important? Again, I mean, I, I, I sort of go back to what's happened over the last five years, you know, in the sense that business as usual doesn't exist anymore. And I think the best advice I could give to people is, yeah, you know, get, get to be really good at architecture because that is fundamentally what you're enthusiastic about, but never lose sight of the rest of the world that's out there, you know, digital media, uh, theatre, um, you know, TV, uh, even, you know, celebrity culture, popular culture, pop music, you know, whatever it is, because ultimately, I think in the future, I mean, I joined BDP straight from Manchester University, so I've been, I'm, I'm a BDP lifer been here for 25 years, a bit like Ryan Giggs at Man United, you know, I suspect the days of the sort of the one uh, practice architect or the one club footballer are probably gone. And in the future, you know, you'll have to engage with lots of different practices, lots of different ways of working, lots of different technologies, lots of different ways of delivering whatever it is you want to do to make the world a better place, which might be drawing a building, but it might not be. So the more outside interests you can have, the more flexible you are, and the more intelligent and informed you are, I think the more employable you'll be, but also the more likely you are to make a difference in the new world, which is going to be a bit different from where it's been before. Perfect. Thank you very much. Okay. That's it.